Imagine a hospital room. In the corner, there is a bed. And in that bed, there is a young woman. She's lying flat on her back. There are tubes coming out of her veins. There's a cuff on her arm. And there are little colored stickers across her chest. She's broken her back and her neck in almost 10 places. And there's a piece of bone that's sticking out in such a way that if she moves, she could cut a nerve and be unable to walk again. And her treatment? Her treatment is to lie still and be in hospital for almost two months. That's a long time to think. It's a long time to remember things. And let's be honest, many people these days don't like being alone with their own mind for more than a couple of minutes. I'm a doctor. I studied medicine at Oxford, and my postgraduate studies are in neuroscience. And I'm very interested in well-being and in how we can use our memory to help this. And I'll return to this girl a bit later on. So every day, we remember things. We remember who we are, how we get to work, hopefully how we get home again, that we get nervous when we talk in front of big groups of people. And so with our memories, we have this incredible ability to hold on to events, onto skills, and onto experiences from our past. And yet, despite memory being such a key part of our identity and of our daily life, there's still a lot that we don't know about it. We do know some things, obviously. We know that memory is complex. So imagine that I am a single nerve cell called a neuron, a bit like this very scientific-looking diagram behind me. And imagine that I have enough projections to reach out and touch every single person in this room here today. So that's about 1,000 people. So times this by 50, 50,000 people, that's enough people to fill an entire Olympic-sized stadium. And I can be in contact with each and every person all at the same time if I want to. And now, imagine that there are more of us than there are stars in the Milky Way. And this starts to give us some kind of an understanding of the complexity of the human brain. So each of us have 100 billion neurons in our brain. And each of these neurons can have up to 50,000 connections. And with these connections, the ones that we use the most, well, they become easier to use. The connections that fire together, wire together, in a way called plasticity. So there are actually structural changes that happen in your brain in response to how you use it. Now, you might be aware that quite a lot of words in medicine are in that popularly spoken language of Latin. <laughs> you might not be aware as to why. The reason for this is that if the words are translated out of Latin, they all start to sound like they belong in a children's storybook. So instead of a very academic and serious sounding conversation about memory involving the amygdala and the hippocampus, it becomes a story about memory involving the almond and the seahorse. So firstly, the almond, or in Latin, this is the amygdala. These are two small areas in our brain about the size and shape of almond nuts. And these areas are very important for processing emotions such as fear and anxiety. They're also very important for emotional memories, memories that are emotionally arousing. And, interestingly, if you have damage in this area of your brain, you might struggle to recognize emotions in someone else's face. Either that, or they've just had a bit too much Botox. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another area of the brain that is very important for memory is the seahorse. So in Latin, this is the hippocampus. Again, we have two of these areas, and they look like seahorses when they're forming. This part of the brain is very important for long-term memory and for skills such as navigation. And there are some interesting studies looking at this seahorse area in London taxi drivers. When a taxi driver even just imagines driving a certain route, there's an increase in activity in this area. And there's also an increase in size in this area, in the drivers versus the non-drivers. With this increase in size, 
corresponding to how long they've been driving for. This seahorse area also has the highest sensitivity to the stress hormone, cortisol, meaning that the seahorse is highly vulnerable to stress. Now, many people assume that memory is like a recording, that it's recorded at the time and then played back to us later when we want to remember something, a bit like watching a film. But memory is actually more like a film set than a finished film. It's a reconstructive process. The lighting and the action need to be created. And in fact, there are studies showing that we actually need to make certain proteins in order to make and keep our long-term memories. If you interfere with the protein, you interfere with the memory. And people also often assume that memory is accurate, particularly for strong memories. And what could be stronger than witnessing a crime? But we know that eyewitness evidence is often incorrect, particularly if there is DNA evidence to the contrary. And some judges are even starting to brief jury panels about the inaccuracies of this type of eyewitness evidence. So the fact that memory can have flaws is obviously important in court cases, and this is starting to be formally recognized in some places. But how does this help us with our well-being or with our daily lives? If we question the accuracy of eyewitness statements told about a crime to a courtroom, we should question our own memories too because these are like the eyewitness statements told about our lives to ourselves. We should look at what memories benefit our well-being and which ones don't, as there's a chance that they're not 100% accurate anyway. And I obviously don't mean questioning your name or how you get to work or the happy memories that you cherish. I also don't mean questioning that certain events have happened. But I do mean looking at some of the memories that pop into your head from time to time, the, the ones that weigh you down, the ones that don't help your well-being, the ones that were often formed under stress, remembering that the seahorse is highly sensitive to stress. Now, of course, we have some memories that are important for our survival. We remember that it hurt to touch the fire, so we don't do it again. And this fear of public speaking is linked to a fear of being judged. If we're judged, we might be rejected. And if we're rejected from our social groups, well, this obviously makes survival more difficult. But as a doctor, I often see how memory impacts on well-being and studying the neuroscience behind it is giving me some answers as to why, but it's also raising many more questions. But in a practical sense, I think I learned the most when I was that young woman from the start of today, lying in that hospital bed, looking at that ceiling, only last year, Evidence shows that memories that are formed with a negative tone or a past focus are associated with increased levels of cortisol. And cortisol, the stress hormone, has a lot of really important roles in our body. But if we have too much of it at levels that are too high for too long, it can start to interfere with things such as our immune system. This can lead to decreased wound healing and decreased bone healing. And you might agree, I had quite a few bones to heal. And I really wanted to get well as quickly as possible. So I started to look at just some of the memories that popped into my head whilst I was lying there, the ones that didn't necessarily help my well-being, with just a hint of skepticism. Think of the children's game, Whispers. Children sit in a circle, one makes up something to say and passes it to the next. They pass it around the circle in this fashion until the last child stands up and says what it is that they've heard. It's normally pretty different to what it started out as. Or think of recreating a scene from a film. 
Each time the lighting is just a little bit different. The shadows are just a little bit different. Something that was light and funny could, after enough recreations, be, be made into something that's quite dark. But the reverse is true too. Something that was dark, well, that could be lightened up. So what if we cross-examined just some of the memories that hold us down, and questioned their accuracy? And the happy memories, the ones that promote our well-being, well, they deserve to be treasured. Thank you.